all of you to the Tuckahoe Senior Center today, and uh, we have David Osborne here again today from St. Paul's Church National Historic Site to talk about intrigue on the Village Green colonial elections. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me back. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm from St. Paul's Church National Historic Site in Mount Vernon which I assume most of you are basically familiar with. So I would uh, go into, you know, background in depth. But generally, St. Paul's on a six-acre plot at the very southern edge of Mount Vernon, almost in the Bronx. It's like 200 yards from the Bronx border. Some people think it is in the Bronx, but it's, in, it's at the southern edge of Mount Vernon, and it consists of the historic church building, which goes back to 1763. And a lot of the exterior is still original. That was the original seat of the town of Eastchester, you know, the, the 350th anniversary. So when the town was founded in 1664 with just 10 families, there about 40 people when they established it was then just a little colonial town, which they had no idea would last 350 years. Some of these colonial towns started up and for various reasons didn't make it. That one makes it. Um, that was where they established the original settlement. They lived right around the village green there. And this thing here, the village green, in those days, you just have a big field in the middle of town and they call it the village green. It's where you do all your communal activities. Uh, St. Paul's was used, the church was used as a hospital during the Revolutionary War. Lots of fighting around there, dangerous area, the British and the Americans battling over that ground really for seven years. And the church was not used for service during the war, too dangerous, no religious services, but it was the biggest, best built building in the whole area. So not surprisingly, all the armies took advantage of its emptiness and its size and location. They constantly took over the church after local battles and used it as a emergency hospital. Many men died in there, both sides, British and Americans. After the war, returned to being a house of worship. The last service in there as a real church was in 1978. By then, they had just uh, run, run out of power as a house of worship. They were down to maybe two families on a given Sunday. The whole area had become industrial, commercial, and the old residential community, which had kept the parish going, really for three centuries, had just scattered. And people had moved away and just found other family churches. So they're down to really just a couple of families. So their last service was 1978. Two years later, it was gifted over to the park service as a National Historic Site. The cemetery right behind it is still occasionally used. It's one of the oldest burial yards in America. There's a couple stones that date to 1704. Some of the original settlers of the town were buried there. And even last year, there were still two burials there. Still occasionally used. It's rare among colonial graveyards. People are still in church there. And out front of it is a little patch of what we preserve, we call the original village green of East Chester, which was the town common. That's where this is going on here. So this is an election, but it, it's a very important, famous election, partly because we know about it. It's covered in it the first issue of a free press in colonial America. And just as the paper's coming out for the first time, there's a, a very controversial well-attended election that occurs right on the village green. In those days, the electorate is just, it's very small. It, it's a colonial time anyway, so there's not many people around. Then you're talking about the adult men who own property. So it's small enough that this, was a, this is the climax of the election. You know, everybody would step forward to the table, open ballot, no secret ballot, no paper ballot. You would just declare your preference in front of all your neighbors and all the possible pressures people could have put on you in terms of you voted for Smith and not Jones. So this is the climax of the election. This gentleman here is a Quaker. He has his hands behind his back. He's refusing to swear an oath on the Bible, being put forth by the sheriff. People are shouting at the situation from either side. That's the climax of the election. So we'll get back. This is a painting in 1953. Till then, no one had really bothered to put the scene on canvas. Cliff Young here was a, a historic painter with the New Rochelle, and I think he was commissioned by the church to create a historic painting. It's the usual, you do your research, you try to think you knew how it looked like, but you know, this is the best thing we have in terms of what the election would have looked like. All the men in Westchester, it was a county-wide election, not just Eastchester. 
So you had men from all over Westchester County there. New York was then a British colony. This is a picture of lower New York in the 1730s. You know, there's the British flag. Um, it's the colony of New York. So it's a royal colony. So it's under the aegis of the king, and the governor, the leading uh, political figure in the colony, is sent over by the crown. And the governor at that time, he's the center of the whole story. His name is William Cosby. Um, he's Irish born, he's a British soldier. Usually they sent soldiers over here to be the governor. He's the king's representative in the colony. Um, he had recently fallen on hard economic times. His, his, his fortune had taken a real slump. And he wanted the job as governor of New York, 1732. He was seen as a very lucrative post. To be governor of New York in colonial times, you could really amass quite a fortune. You got your regular salary, but there were all sorts of other ways, if you were clever and manipulative, to increase your fortune. Lots of things came through the governor's office, appointments and, and offices. You could demand certain payments. You had an automatic cut of the fur trade, which was very lucrative. So it was seen as quite a thing to get. And you got it through, through the court. You didn't get it by the elected people of the colony. This was a royal colony. He gets it in a pretty common way. This is the Duke of Newcastle. He's the king's um, colonial secretary in the 1730s. He would decide who got these governorships in the colonies. And Cosby's wife is the first cousin of the Duke of Newcastle. So there's a family connection. He lets it be known he really wants this job. His wife lobbies her first cousin, who's the colonial secretary, and Cosby is appointed governor. In its own, not that that's usually how those things happen in the 18th century. Somebody had a friend at court, somebody had a family tie. This was seen as a great patronage club to get one of these colonial governorships. So Cosby is elected governor, or appointed governor. The first thing he did when he got here, right away set off a lot of the people in the colony of New York. This gentleman had been acting governor for about a year and a half. In, in the 18th century, it takes a long time for things to move. You get the appointment. It's eight weeks to get here, even if it's a good voyage. You have to pack up. You're basically moving to America with your family. So it takes him a long time to get here. In the interim, this man's name is Rip Van Dam. Does it, not, his name's not that important. He was the acting governor, drawing the salary in that year. And once Cosby got to the colony, the first thing he did, which right away set people off, what, is, what are his real motives? He demanded half of his salary. You are my acting governor for a year. You drew the salary, but in title, I was the governor. I demand half of your salary, which right away set some people in the colony off in terms of what were his, why was he really coming here to be governor. It's the first thing he does, and he, he refuses. He will not give him the half a salary. So Cosby goes legally. He goes through the courts to recover it. And rather than just go through the regular courts where you face a jury, he takes advantage, he's the governor. So the Supreme Court of the colonies, a three-man panel, all of them appointed by or beholden to the governor. So he comes around the normal process of, of legality in the colony and immediately appeals to the Supreme Court, thinking the three judges on the panel basically work for him. So of course they'd be favorable towards his lawsuit. Right away set people off. And even within the first month or two, Cosby did a lot of things that set a lot of people in the colony off. His personality, he was standoffish. He didn't meet with the other people in the colony like you should as a new governor. Right away set a lot of people off. That he was here for the wrong reasons, not the right reasons. So once he brings suit, he runs into this man named Lewis Morris, lived in what's the Bronx, Morris Heights, you know, all those things named after the Morrises. Very wealthy man, had lived, grew, up, grew up in the colony of New York. He was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So the, the suit is appealed to him. He's the Chief of Three Justices. And he dismisses the lawsuit. That there's no legal precedent towards recovering half the salary. And he takes the extra step of writing a fairly powerful legal brief that the case should never be brought in the first place. This was obviously you know, a political effort to appeal directly to a court, which should have been favorable. You should have gone through the regular courts in New York City to bring suit. Right away, you're doing something which was, uh, you thought, you know, you're using a political muscle. And he has the opinion published, which is right away starting to take on the governor. 
And the governor does, as he could at the time, dismiss him as chief justice. In his mind, this was a he didn't, you know, affront to the governor. It's one thing to dismiss the case, to publish a legal opinion saying the governor was wrong from the start and have it published is upping the ante. So he does dismiss him. And this is a wealthy, prominent man who's been the chief justice of the colony for 20 years, very well established, um, not just a provincial uh, colonial. And once in opposition, he starts to build an opposition to the governor. Men like him who are opposed to the governor, that he's not uh, governing the colony properly. A lot of this was respect. See, by the 1730s, People had lived here for a long time. They didn't see themselves as just a bunch of provincial colonials. They had their own sense of being an elite, wealthy men who were used to being in control, and the governor just dismissed them and treated them all as you know, a bunch of provincial colonials, which is what he thought they were. He's the representative of the king. Who are these men? So he starts to build an opposition to the governor, men who want to take on the governor and actually get him removed from power. A couple of people, he, he gathers, this is one of them, his name is James Alexander, he's a lawyer in New York City, excellent writer, good lawyer, he joins Morris's opposition. Another one is this gentleman named William Smith. Tends to be men who are lawyers who feel slighted by Cosby, well this is our colony, you know. And previous governors had been a little smarter, they've gotten along with the leading gentleman in the colony. Cosby is not very politically astute. So they start to build an opposition to him. And the governor, being the governor, the representative of the King George, a lot of people, the colony starts to break up into parties. A group of men opposing the governor, and many people stay with the governor. He is the governor, he's the king's man in New York, he has lots of patronage power. So by all means, not everybody joins the opposition. They start to break up into one camp or the other, among the people active in politics. This is one of the men who stayed with the governor. His name is Delancey. He becomes the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court once Morris is terminated. Delancey Street in Manhattan is named for him and his family. And one of the first things that the men do, taking on the governor, is they establish a newspaper. Probably the most radical piece of the whole thing. Literacy is still not great, but it's growing. More people can read. And at the time, New York only had one newspaper. It was called the Gazette. It was the official voice of the governor, which whenever it covered politics, would only print the, the story from the governor's side. So if you're starting a political opposition against the governor and you want to get the word out, one thing they decided to do, which was really unheard of till then, was to establish a second newspaper. It's an independent press really run by their party, so it's kind of like a party press. But this was quite unusual at the time to establish a press that was not under the official organ of the governor. And they hired John Peter Zager to print it. This is an early issue of the New York Weekly Journal. In those days, papers used it four pages. They had lots of commercial news, no pictures yet or anything. And the, they would not print too many copies, but you know, one copy would go to the tavern, and it might be read by 60 people. You know, when you go to the library today, and they have those newspapers on the wooden racks, they're continuing an old tradition that in their day, that's really how newspapers circulated. So circulation figures don't mean anything, because one issue might be read by 80 people. Um, and there's Zanger's name there. Now the man who worked from it, so Zanger is really like, he's not a journalist, he's a printer. He knows how to put the paper out. And in those days, to set the type, each letter is set by hand. Each sheet is run off of the printing press. It's really quite a skill, it's a craft. It's not just an unskilled job. So the men running the paper, Morris and the other guys I showed you, they're very wealthy, they can fund the paper, they can do all the writing, but they don't know how to physically put it out. So they need somebody to put the paper out. And Zenger is a young German immigrant. Um, he had been an apprentice printer. He had just opened up his own print shop, just as this is starting to break, looking for work. So a group of wealthy gentlemen come to his shop one day, Mr. Zenger, we want you to print our paper. Don't worry about the editorial content. We'll do all the writing. You know, you're the printer. We can't do that. So he agrees to print it for a fee, which is not surprising. You know, he, he needs work. He's a young man, and he's just put the shingle outside of his door looking for work. So there, he is, 
He is the printer. I think the men printing it are all lawyers, and they're very smart and clever, and they make sure if this ever comes to legal trouble down the road, their names never appear in the paper. They always write the articles unsigned op-eds, unsigned letters to the editor. Zander's name is in the paper every week because he's the printer. It's up technically under his aegis. And I think they knew what they were doing, that if there was ever legal trouble, nobody could ever legally link them to this paper because their names never literally appeared. They are all law. They know the libel law very well, these guys. Zander is maybe a little naive, but it's his, it's his job. He, he needs work. This is a typical early issue. They draw on these series of, it's kind of lost by now, but in the 18th century, um, there was a series of essays. They come from England. So when the gentlemen take on the governor, they draw on political opposition thought, printed up the essays on liberty, civil and religious, coming from England. Cato in Roman history is the critic of Julius Caesar as the Roman world is moving from the Republic to the Empire. So he, people in the 18th century who look back on the Roman world with great idolization, <coughs> saw him as the great Republican champion of ancient Rome. So they're always using Cato. Um, and these were essays that were printed in England in the 1720s, about 140 of them, written by two or three English writers, which were about political opposition, freedom of religion freedom of the press, the need to make sure the king never got too strong, the, the importance of local prerogative against an overreaching executive. And they were widely reprinted and sold in the colonies, read by many gentlemen interested in politics. So when they start to oppose, not the king, but it is the king's representative, they have all these ideas. They're coming from England. They're not foreign. They're part of the English political tradition. They're opposition, but they have like a certain sanction. This is coming from the mother country. This is like <coughs> acceptable political opposition. And a lot of times in Zanger's paper, I think like, they would just take whole essays from Cato's letters and reprint them. So they're drawing on like a block of political thought, which is known and kind of accepted in the English-speaking world. In the middle of this controversy, the election comes up. Right in the middle of the governor, and the opposition starting to gather their forces. And the governor, even though he's unfair and probably corrupt, is still the governor. He's King George's man. And in the 18th century, that's very prestigious. So a lot of people oppose him, but he is the king's representative. And this isn't the American Revolution. There's no talk of independence. This is gentlemen thinking, we just want a new governor sent over by King George. We just, that William Cosby is, is just unfair and corrupt and malfeasant. So in the middle, there's an election. It's a special election for a Westchester-wide representative of the Colonial Assembly. And in those days, Westchester is all of what's today Westchester and all of the Bronx. There was no Bronx till the 1800s. So it's a huge county. And you're going to have one representative for the whole county in the uh, Colonial Assembly. The incumbent, his name was William Willett, a good friend of uh, Morris's, also lived in the Bronx. He agreed to quit. Once he quit, it opened up the seat to have a special election with the understanding that Morris would run and probably win and get back into political life and have a platform for which to oppose the governor. Because at the moment, he doesn't have a public job. He was fired as chief justice. He wants some kind of political platform to take on the governor. So his good friend agrees to resign, and they call a special election. This is typically how you try to, I mean, in the 18th century, it's hard enough to get the word out. When you have a special election, you know, like when Mrs. Clinton became Secretary of State, I think we had a special election for her Senate seat, not in the normal cycle, somewhere in between. They call us, it's very hard to get the word out for regular election. You know, somebody could go around, this is Colonial Williamsburg, but something like this, you know, nailing something up on tree posts and on public buildings. There would be a special election on the East Chester Green, some of the details and the dates. Um, and, and Morris declares his candidacy. That was the point. It was a strategy. And the governor's party realizes this is the political challenge of the day. They want to make sure Morris doesn't get into office. They have to put up a candidate. So they accept the challenge. And they put up, and actually a man from East Chester, his name was William Forrester. At the time, he was just a school teacher. 
So there's a big stature gap. You've got a former chief justice running against a local school teacher. They choose East Chester. It's not the biggest village in Westchester County. It's an average sized village. But a lot of things happened in East Chester in the colonial times. It is, in a funny way, it's like the transportation center of the county. You got five different roads coming from all points in Westchester County meeting on the East Chester Green, today's St. Paul's. The White Plains Road right out here was there then bringing people down. The Boston Post Road bringing people over from like Maranek, New Rochelle, Larchmont, uh, Pelham. You had roads going down into what's today the Bronx, coming up through what's today Co-op City. Another one, what's today South Vernon and Mount Vernon, going over through Yonkers to the Hudson River. So they choose East Chester because it is, oddly, the center of Westchester County. It's not the biggest town. It's just an average-sized town. But mostly because the church was there, it had developed into an interesting juncture of all the roads, most of which are still there today. But now they're paved modern highway. But almost all these roads were there in the 18th century. So the election is set for East Chester, October 29, 1733, on Monday. Almost all the electorate is farmers, probably 96%. This is the 18th century. So if you want a farmer, to, in those days, you've got to physically go to the election place. You're asking someone to give up two or three days. You've got to travel there. It could be as much as 30, 40 miles. You've got to vote. And then you've got to come home. Along the way, you're sleeping a day or two. So the reason why, and we still have this today. It doesn't make any sense. I think it's just the leftover. The reason why we still vote late October, early November, is the harvest is already in. It's pivotal. In a, if, you, if you do this in August, you're just not going to get the turnout. These farmers are not going to give up three or four days in the midst of farming season. So you're looking at a nice harvest here, ideally good. You want something between mid-October and mid-November. We still have that today. I think it's just left over from colonial times. It doesn't have to be. But in their day, it's got to be the harvest is in. All the farmers can say, OK, whatever I brought in for the year, I've made, I've marketed, I put it away for the winter. I can do something. And you want to do it before the worst of the snow is set. This is a terribly bad blizzard that struck New York in 1710. When all, you know, the, it's hard enough to travel today in the wintertime. And there it's almost impossible. So something between mid-October and mid-November is when you're going to do this. So they set the election for October 29, 1733, on East Chester Green. Physically, everybody has to be there. And it is a county-wide election. This would have been a bridge over the Hutchinson River, the East Chester Creek. So here's Pelham, here's East Chester, Mount Vernon. That's the type of thing. Not there anymore. This today would be Exit 8 off the Hutch. And this would be Sanford Boulevard and Mount Vernon. This would be Colonial Avenue and Pelham. The Pelham Library is over here. Typical thing that everybody's marching over. And to build the turnout, especially Morris, who is a very wealthy man and really wants this thing, he hires probably about 30 men to get out the vote. And physically, that means they have to go scour the county, bring in the voters. And typically, let's say the post road, I think most of his supporters came down the post road. They would just go to the northern edge of Westchester and start up there. And they would come into the village common, and they would talk about the importance of this election, but then it's three days away. So let's say it's October 26th. They had plenty of rum and food to offer everybody, you know, to get out the vote drive. And it was, some of it was political. Mostly, the point they kept making was that Governor Cosby has overstepped the bounds. He, he, based on the English tradition that they had by then, the king, or in this case, the king's representative, is not supposed to get involved with elections to the assembly. That's for the commons or the people. And he's overstepping his bounds. And they bring up all this idea of overreaching kings from the 17th century, the English Revolution. And they start to pick up 20 or 30 people. And they get very excited and have a lot of momentum. Then they march down into Portchester. They do the same thing. You pick up another 30. Maybe it's a day later. Then you're in Mamarin. Then you're in Larchmont. Then you're in New Rochelle. Then you're in Pelham. Then finally you get to East Chester, Mount Vernon. And it's like a religious revival in the 19th century. You pick up steam and pick up momentum. You pick up another 30. 
Somebody gives you food that night. You sleep somewhere. The next day, it becomes exciting. Men want to join this caravan, which is very generous. Morris is a very wealthy man. There's lots of rum flowing all over the place, lots of food. But it's not, I wouldn't be that you know, cynical to say that's all it was. There's a political imperative of Governor Cosby being an overreaching, autocratic man. And he's not literally running, but it's clear that his candidate is running. So by the time you get down to East Chester, that's what the last house that would have witnessed this election would have been right across the street from St. Paul's, William Crawford's Tavern, built in the 1730s, still there until 1966. Right across with this today, a two-story glass office tower. By the time you get down there, you've got 130 people. And other Morris agents started down in the Bronx, and they brought up 80. And then a bunch came down the White Plains Road from like the center of the county. They all come together. And they, there's no walkie-talkies or cell phones, but they all have designated territories. They're bringing in the vote, which is bodies. It's not just you know, you're bringing your people to the polls to literally vote. So by the time you get there, you just imagine some of them might have lived in this house and woke up you know, on the morning of October 29, 1733. It's a Monday morning, nice crisp fall day apparently, and usually you looked out on the East Chester Common, which is today the St. Paul Cemetery. That's literally where they all stood that day. And you probably saw you know, two cows and a pig and a couple of goats. And suddenly that morning, in your little farming village, you probably thought the whole, you have 500 people have descended on this village green of this fairly small town who have come, and you probably thought you were at the center of the universe. Just imagine the human spectacle. And what they do is, they march in, the Mars group brings about 300, they all come together, they, that was their rendezvous point, they actually met at that tavern. And in the front, you have about six men on horseback, a couple of them have trumpets, a couple of them have violins. They're announcing their entrance. Other men are lined up behind them. They march onto the village green, which is basically today the St. Paul Cemetery, and they march around about two, three times to show their numbers. They're kind of, by now, it's more than a religious revival, that they're going to war, and they show what they got. And then they line up on one side. And then the other side, which is Forrester, who is the governor's candidate. And what the governor did, like a week or two before the election, is a huge stature gap. You've got a former chief justice of the colony, very well-known, Lewis Morris, running against a local school teacher. So a week or two before, he's the governor, he suddenly elevates him to be the Westchester County clerk. So that now you have a chief justice running against a county official to like close the stature gap. He just did that so he would look better. And he can do that, he's the governor. It's just a patriotic appointment. So the Morris part, the uh, Forrester party does the same thing. They're bringing their people down mostly from along the Hudson River, but they come down about 220 men, and they march around the Green too to show their numbers, and then they line up on opposite sides, and they just wait until the election's going to start. The last minute is some of this. This is like, you know, political glad handing at the last second, because everybody's waiting around to try to sway a vote, you know, a drink, put your arm around somebody, some kind of political appeal. There probably wasn't that much of this. If you've come down with the Morris Party, from Large Montgomery, Pelham, or Porchester, you came with that party, so you're there to vote for that person. Not too many people really got there undecided. There probably was a little of this, there always is at the last second, because they're waiting for the sheriff to come to conduct the election, and he's late that day. He probably was conferring with the governor, because he's a political appointee, that he's going to go to East Chester and try to make sure Morris doesn't win, because he's the governor's man, and Forrester is running as the opposition candidate. This is just one of the things, you know, is there anything still there today that they, this is one of the old gravestones in the St. Paul's yard, somebody who died in 17. Because really, they're like in the cemetery. So as the men are walking around, they occasionally like stepping over a gravestone or two. So this is one that's there today. Somebody died in 1704. It's still a legible gravestone that we could still see that they would have sought to, because it's right there in the cemetery, still there. 
Now, in those days, the East Jesse had its original church. The one you see today was not built until 1763. In those days, the town common was dominated by this little wooden church built in 1700. It's a wooden building. But as the men come into the, the, the big field that day, they got to gather around something. So they would have gathered around this little wooden building, which would be close to where the Salvation Army is today, but still on the St. Paul's property. Uh, this one was torn down during the Revolutionary War because unfortunately it was made out of wood. So when all the soldiers were all around during the war, anything wood was fair game. This thing was, was totally demolished. But in, in 1733, it is the East Chester Eating House. It's the town hall. It's the big building on the green. So of course that's where they gather. Now this is the article that appeared about the election. Because what happened was Zanger's paper is just getting started at this time. He started the print. It took him a while to get the press rolling. He comes out with the first issue just at the time. So everything comes together. The big political battle, the huge turnout, and the first issue of the first, you could say, the first free press in America. I know it doesn't look like that much to us, but this is really the first time in American history where there's a multi-paragraph descriptive article about what an election looked like. Until then, we don't really know how they voted, because here you finally have documentation. And in its day, this is really quite striking. And still like a starting point, when people, even not in New York, historians and other places, how did these columnists vote? How did they do all these things? This is the earliest recorded account we have, because you have the newspaper is there. And a lengthy article appears. So here's the sheriff, Nicholas Cooper. It says, Westchester, October 29, 1733, the New York Weekly Journal. He is the governor's high sheriff of the county. And he has come there that day to try to make sure that Forrester wins. He, he's not really an objective observer. He, he's a political appointee in a very politically charged atmosphere, trying to make sure Morris doesn't get back into the assembly. So what pretty clearly happened is he walked onto the green that day. And this is obvious. Like, there's 300 men standing here and about 200 there. And usually what they would do in those days, it was very obvious that Morris had the bigger party. Sometimes the chair would say, stand by your man. One of the truth is that's where the phrase comes from. And he was supposed to stand behind the candidate of your choice. And they would look at whoever had the longer line. And they'd say, he wins. Look at that. He's got a much longer line than him. He's the winner. But on the, I think he walked onto the green that day. He's coming up from the Bronx. So he's coming up the Post Road. Um, he saw what it was obvious, that this was clearly a better turnout there than there. And the Quakers stand out. There's probably about 40, 45 men there that day who are Quakers. They come up from a Quaker meeting house in the Bronx. It would be right around where Herbert Lehman High School is today, just over the Whitestone Bridge in that Whitestone part of the Bronx. But that's West just the county. They've come up in a group. And if you look at a colonial crowd, this is a self-identified group of men. Like you could say a self-identified minority. They dress a certain way. They have these simple coats, simple hats. They all stood together. So if you walked onto the green that day, which is almost definitely what Cooper did, and he said, look at that. There's 40 Quakers over there. They stand out. They're a self-identified group of men. And they're nonconformists to they, they do, um, they are legally, they should be voters, but they, they clearly stand out. And if he's looking to disenfranchise a group of people to try to make him win, it must have just been so obvious. Because they're kind of clannish, they all stand together, they dress a certain way. He would have said, look at all those Quakers over there. So what he's doing here, this is the climax of the election. Technically, in those days, to vote, you needed to own 40 pounds of property. This is coming over from England. I know it sounds horrible to us in the 21st century, but in their day, you know, it, government exists to protect life and property. The people who vote should be the shareholders who own property, who would most be affected if, if property was not managed well by, by those in power. And what they did, they just took the same thing from England. 40 pounds of property was usually about 50 to 80 acres. Since it's value, it depends on where it is. Closer to New York City, the value is higher. Where like up at Yorktown, 
who might own 80 acres, if you're down in the Bronx, who might be 50. And usually, I know it sounds really unfair to us, in the 18th century, usually if you got into the field that day, everybody knew you. They, didn't, they technically could pull out the tax rolls and say, how much do you own? But it would be like everybody from Largemont knows this guy. He's one of us. He's a property owner. They usually assumed if you were there that day, you probably deserved to be. Technically, they could pull out the tax roll and say, let's see, do you really own enough? But in its real administration, it wasn't as restrictive as it was because you never would have gotten there that day if you were in any way you know, it, obviously, if you're a woman, you're not even there. Unless you live in East Chester, you just came out of your house to watch the spectacle. You have to be 21 and over. You have to own property. But technically, Sheriff Cooper could force everybody to swear an oath from the Bible that they met the property qualification. It's a rarely used technique, but not technically illegal. And what he's doing here, it was well known in colonial America that Quakers, for religious reasons, will not take an oath from the Bible. I think Quakers still don't take oaths on the Bible. To them, it was a sacrilege. If anything, there's a point in the New Testament where Jesus says, thou shalt swear no false oaths, if anything. And they interpreted that to mean that this is just a man-made concept. You can't force us to swear this oath on the Bible. It violates our conscience. We won't do it. And this was pretty well known in the 18th century. Quakers used to go to jail in England. They couldn't serve on juries or testify because they wouldn't take an oath on the Bible. So we kind of knew that. Sometimes they would say to the Quakers, OK, this violates your religious convictions. You can affirm and not swear. But since the goal here was to make sure the Quakers didn't vote, he was not going to be that judicious that day. So the Quakers, and this is a typical thing. He has his hands behind his back. Sheriff Cooper is saying, swear on the Bible that you read the oath. This man who's on the Morris side is probably saying, let him affirm, let him affirm, which sometimes they would do. Because this is a group of men who live, they're residents, they're over 21. They certainly should be allowed to vote by all other means. This is simply a piece of religious conviction that they think this is a sacrilege, and they simply won't do it. But it could be used against them if you wanted to. So one by one, the Quakers walk up to the table, and they all refuse to swear an oath, and they are disenfranchised. They're not allowed to vote that day. One by one, they're saying, you can't vote, you can't vote, you can't vote. So eventually, all of the Quakers are disenfranchised. And the article about it, that probably why it is, this is a, a, it becomes a milestone in American religious freedom because it's documented. This is a new thing. No one had ever covered an election before. And I'm sure Cooper had no idea that this would happen because it's totally new. That the, it, one of the lengthy pieces here is how all these Quakers, who otherwise should be allowed to vote, they definitely owned the property. They were very good farmers. They're fairly wealthy, the Quakers. These are not a poor group of men. They're Westchester County residents. They're over 21. It's this one little thing that they won't do, and they didn't make it up at the moment. This is a serious piece of religious conviction that they think it's, it's immoral or you know, deeply irreligious. So it's actually documented in here. Lately, much of the article talks about that. So a year later, as a direct result of this, because it was documented, New York does pass a law that in the future, if this ever happens again, the people called Quakers, or friends, I think, would be allowed to affirm and not swear on the Bible. This probably had happened many other times. It went by unreported. But here you have documentation, which does kind of change the dynamics of the law. Now, Morris wins anyway. He had the numbers. So if he had 300, he had 220. You take away 40, he still wins the election. It was much closer than it might have been, because the Quakers are disenfranchised. He wins a closer election than otherwise might have. And that, the article does acknowledge that. On this day, Lewis Morris, late Chief Justice of the province, was by a great majority elected a representative for the county of Westchester. This being an election of great expectations, and where the court and country parties were carried, I shall give my readers a particular account of it, as I have for a person that was present at it. Now, somebody who was there that day, it's not Zayther, he, he's the printer, he's back in the shop in New York City, but somebody in the Morris party, who everyone always thinks it was this Alexander guy, who's a lawyer and a very good writer, he was physically there. He, in all likelihood, wrote this thing. But it is an eyewitness account, one of the first times in American history, and one of the, the things that we know about. 
because it was covered, because it was documented. The original still, I think the original of this mm -hmm. issue is at the New York Public Library, but it's still widely reprinted and widely studied. I think you can get it on the internet. You just Google, you know, East Chester election 1733, you could read the whole thing. And as I say, it doesn't mean that, doesn't look that much to us, but for its day, it's really quite a groundbreaking piece of American political history. Morris wins anyway. So the Quaker exclusion doesn't really deny him the victory. After that, the story kind of leaves St. Paul's. It can, the paper continues for another year to write very critical articles of the governor. The only name appearing in every week is John Peter Zenger, who's probably a little naive, doesn't realize what might happen here. And by 1734, so about 50 issues a year, a weekly paper, Governor Cosby does shut the paper down. He, he uses his right of eminent domain as the governor, the king's representative, to say this paper is committing seditious libel. It's printing critical articles of the king's representative. It's libelous. I'm shutting it down. So he, it takes him a while legally. He finally gets there. Zanger is thrown in jail. They burn about four issues that they thought were particularly offensive. And he's going to be tried. Um, and in those days, see, this is the common law. Seditious libel to them had this narrow definition of printing something critical of the king's representative. It didn't matter if it was true or not. They hadn't really gotten to the point where truth was a defense against seditious libel. If you printed something critical of the king, or in this case, the king's governor, in the English tradition, in their English colonies, you have caused people to doubt the wisdom of the king, you're undermining society, you're cutting at the girders of our foundations, like everybody will now distrust the king and his representative, you're guilty of seditious libel. It didn't matter if the things were true or not. So Zanger is in jail. Now, I mean, there's something unfair here. He didn't write any of the articles. He printed them. His name is in the paper every week. The other men who are wealthy lawyers are the ones doing the writing. They do come to his defense. I guess you could say he kind of went to jail for them because he's not writing them. But they do, they're all lawyers. So initially, they, they immediately rush to his defense. They realize what he's done for them. So they're going to be his defense lawyers. In the early proceedings of the seditious libel trial, the Chief Justice disbars some of these men who are the Zanger men. So Zanger then has no counsel. Um, and a famous trial is in New York City in 1735. In the climax, the men finally bring up a man named Andrew Hamilton, who is one of the best known lawyers of the day in the colonies. He lived in Philadelphia. Um, and he, he, he wants to try the idea that truth can be a defense against seditious libel. That, yes, they, he admits Zanger's art paper printed all these things. That is true. But if they contain truth, then how could they be, how could they be libelous if they're true? Which was a, a novel idea in English common law. It didn't really exist in the common law. He wants to introduce it as a lawyer. The great advantage he has in Zanger is that this is a jury trial. And by then, Governor Cosby is very unpopular in New York City where the trial occurs. There's a, a jury of his peers who are very sympathetic to Zanger, who's a very sympathetic character, and they're very opposed to the governor. So at the end of the trial, the Chief Justice, there's only two, because Morris had been displaced, they never bothered to refill it, so there's two rather than three. The Chief Justice Delancey basically says, ignore everything that Mr. Hamilton said. It doesn't, the only thing that matters is here's all these issues of the New York Weekly Journal. John Peter Zenger is obviously the printer, and they have printed things critical of the king's representative in the colonies. He's guilty of seditious libel. Ignore everything he said. So the jury retires, and in those days, juries were very timid. They usually would do what the judge would tell them to do. The judge would instruct them to return a verdict, and they were very timid and very deferential to, to judges. So the jury, though, in this case, accepts his argument. They return within less than an hour a verdict of not guilty. That they accept his novel argument that truth is a valid defense against seditious libel, and they things can't be libelous if they were true, even though they were critical of the governor. So Zanger is, is apparently acquitted based on that. He's the real hero of the day. He's carried on his shoulder. He's the lawyer who introduced this idea. 
He goes over to a tavern, they have a big feast and a thing. Baker actually spends two more nights in jail before he finally gets released. The real hero is the lawyer, not so much the defendant here. And it doesn't really change the law, but it introduces a precedent, which is then drawn on occasionally in colonial times, that in some cases, truth could be the defense against seditious life. The law basically remains unchanged. This is more an exception, but it is something for people to point back to, as in this case, it was <coughs> his point kind of was that in the colonies, he didn't really want to change the law. For colonials to oppose the governor, what else can they do? They don't have many options. The king's representative seems to hold all the power. They have to have the right to hold them to higher standards or to criticize them to you know, to do something like what Linger did. So it's often seen as a precedent um, for that. Morris, by the way, got back into public life, returned to the assembly, and pressed the case to try to remove the governor. Now, they want the governor out of there. And it's not the American Revolution. They don't want independence. They just want the king to send over a better governor. So he eventually gathers lots of signatures from the colonies. He does go to London. He tries to see the proper people in the government to get a new governor sent over, and he's very unsuccessful. They will not even talk to him. And he, get, he gets, he writes this one interesting letter back to the colonies while there, that, boy, when we get over here, we really are a bunch of colonials. Here we are in our colony. We think we're established men of stature and authority and power. And when you get to the seat of the British Empire, they wouldn't even talk to him. He could, they would know one of these things, come back in a week, come back in two weeks, go, go see him, go see him, go see him. He never even got to pretend, present the signatures on the petitions calling for Cosby's removal. So he is actually unsuccessful and comes back to the colonies quite, quite distressed. But the, the election of, on the village green in St. Paul's is, you know, is an event that occurred right there. Um, on the, on the turf that we still preserve and hold. It, it's like a monumental issue in and of itself, partly because we know about it, and it, that doesn't happen before, after it does, that you had all these people coming together on the green at East Chester, and it is actually documented, so we actually know about it. And the election is very widely known as like a precedent for understanding American colonial political life because we have the resources. Right. And I ran through a little quickly there. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments? Or? Just, Dave, just yeah. a clarification about voters. It was strictly landowners? Yeah, yeah it's on and property. Strictly, strictly men, landowners. I mean, you had to own 40 pounds of property. If you were a tenant farmer and you didn't own, but you had a long-term lease, and you made improvements to the property at a certain level, they would let you vote. Because there's a lot of big landlord estates on the Hudson River where a lot of men have like a lifetime lease and are virtual <laughs> property owners, but they don't really own it because their landlord does, and their tenant farmer, they, you could qualify as a voter. So if you were a business, a business owner, you owned a little Store or right. I mean, in Westchester County, you're talking about a rural constituency. In New York City, which is urban and different, so you don't necessarily have people on, they had another stipulation that if you became a citizen of the city, which means you've gone through certain qualifications. But up here in Westchester County, <coughs> where it's agricultural, you know, um, it, it, I know it really sounds unfair to us, doesn't it? You know, but in America, this is America, so that that 40 pound thing in England was very restrictive. You get 8% of the men in this county in England voting. Here in the colonies, that's why they're all coming here. This is America, there's all this land, this is the great place. Like as much as 70 or 80% of the men in some of the colonies over to the county could actually vote. So relative to the world of the 18th century, it's a very democratic world. The percentage of people voting, terrible by our standards, absolutely. But for its day, it's actually pretty democratic. And the fact that all those men got there that day, who thought something was at stake, and 500 men in rural Westchester County took three days to get there, vote, 
register their position, whatever it was, shows that, you know, they took it quite seriously. And they thought they had, you know, you, you were, I mean, the way to view it today maybe is, you know, people say, uh, it, they, it was the shareholders. You know, if you go to a big meeting of stockholders today, and that's who has a vote on the board of this corporation, that's kind of how they viewed it. That government existed to protect life and property. And the people who should have a say in how government is run were those who would be most affected by the good or bad disposition of property, and it would be those who own property. I mean, later on, this comes controversial. At the time of the American Revolution, this is seen as a vestige of colonialism, monarchialism, property qualifications fall, and then eventually by the 1820s, they're eliminated totally. But at this time, since it's pretty widely distributed, because such a surprising percentage of men do own land, I mean, in an agricultural world, you know, 50 to 80 acres is not a huge farm. It's kind of average. So that most men who are farmers own land free of debt did vote, or could vote, doesn't mean they always did. And that, as I said, when the actual disposition of it, that this thing is very interesting with, you gotta put your hand on the Bible, but in reality, if you showed up that day and everybody from Largemont knew you, and yep, he's one of us, he's a farmer, he owns that farm over there, they didn't really say, do you own 39.5 pounds or is it 40? They would just say, you seem to be one of the, if you were a stranger or a day laborer who just moved to town and didn't own any property and you showed up, they certainly wouldn't let you vote. But the basic, you know, steady population who were the middle class farmers of the colony, they could vote and did in much larger numbers than anybody had ever thought they could have in England. So you are building a group of people who are used to, you know, political participation, and they pass it on to their sons, and you know, you're building something here that's different than they had in England, where the participation in public life is, relative to the time, pretty wide, actually. Yeah? What else did Governor Crosby do? Oh, what did he do? Illegal. You know, that was illegal. I mean, in Albany, there was fairly good relations between the local people and the Indians up there. He got involved in treaty negotiations in a way that made no sense and like reversed a whole trend of fairly good relations. And then he annoyed lots of people in Albany. And some of it, I think it was just personal. The governor of New York was supposed to hold public conferences. You know, twice a month, he was supposed to let everybody come into the mansion, meet and greet, talk, air the issues, you know, vent a little. He refused to do that. He thought he was above it, that this was something that the king's representative shouldn't have to talk to some mere provincials. So even stylistically, he set people off. And he got involved in things throughout the colony in little and big ways that didn't seem to respect the idea that there were people who really lived here. And this wasn't just a brand new colony of, of primitive frontier people. People who lived in New York for them. You know, New York's been a colony for 50 years. Two, three generations of people who were slowly starting to feel that, you know, this is our colony. And governors before him had been a little smarter. They'd been a little more respectful and understanding of local feelings. He simply, I mean, if he was really coming here to recover his own political, I mean, financial fortunes, he acted that way. And he slowly but surely alienated quite a few people in the colony. Although in the long run, they couldn't remove him from office. Because back in London, he still had the support of the, of the royal officials. Yeah. David, the, um, well, I can ask a question. Uh, the first time that Main Street and Tuckahoe appeared on maps was 1728, which leads me to believe that maybe this is what prompted the mapping, the, uh, the uh, Zenger trial. Uh, let's see, because the election occurred in 1733. Could be. Yeah. I hadn't, heard, I hadn't really thought of that, but. No, and one other thing. Yeah. Up until about the 1960s, in order to run for office, you had to own property. So that's mm -hmm. just a leftover from colonial days. Yeah, yeah, right. Really? Yeah, East Chester often comes up in colonial times as a pretty important place because it is the junction of all the roads. In and of itself, it's not the biggest town, it's not the wealthiest town. But if it's the rail junction, or in this case, the road junction, 
when you want to do something, you know, all roads led to East Chester, so of course important things happened there. It was the place where everybody could gather. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, um, Loya Morris, who became a senator. Was he eventually able to get rid of the governor? No, he, was, I mean, he got back into the assembly, so now he has a platform. He tried to get rid of the governor. He and his party felt he won. They had momentum. He's a wealthy man. He pays his own passage over to London. The only way to get rid of the governor is to get him recalled. And you have to go back to the seat of power, which is London. And when he went back there, he did, um, you know, he had petitions signed for people from all over the colony, talking about the, the high-handed, injudicious way that he, he was running. The, and very deferential. You know, the king's representative, the king's colony, we need a better guy. Send over a better guy. And when he got there, I think it was a real rude awakening for him that when you really come into the seat of power, this is an empire. It really is. And to them, he's some boorish provincial from what's this place called New York? Who are you? What's your title? Are you a lord or a sir? Oh, you're Lewis Morris. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Come back next week and maybe we'll talk to you. Uh, we're not we're too busy. Go talk to the undersecretary, to the undersecretary, to the undersecretary. We're busy. And he actually stayed there for a long time. Not only was he unsuccessful, I'm sure we've all had this occasional feeling. When you get to run around from government, that's kind of what happened to him in a big way. He never even got to present the petitions. And he eventually was so disconsolate, he just came back home. So uh, for other reasons, Cosby in 1738 is going to die. But there's, that's like the, the next chapter of the story. If anybody's interested, I mean, there's lots of books on this. Let's see, what's the best one? Pat Bonamy, B-O-N-O-M-I. It's a book on colonial New York, but this is a focus. I throw it in every library. It's called A Factious People, F-A-C-T-I-O-U-S. I know it's in the East Chester Library. And a man named Stanley Katz, K-A-T-Z, wrote a book called New Castles, New York. Newcastle is this guy here, the head of the patronage. And it's from his perspective as being the one in England who was responsible for the colonies. So those are two. This is what that Cosby Morris history. It comes up all the time in colonial New York history, but those are two in particular. And they all reference the East Chester election, but then they talk about other things going on. OK, everybody? Thanks for listening. Thank So again, David, thank you so much for coming. We enjoyed your presentation, and I think we women in particular are glad we don't live in colonial America. <laughs> and thank you again to the St. Paul National Store Site. on paying off all those student loans. Finally, right? How'd you manage that anyway? I started tracking my spending, changed a couple of habits. Wow. I'm kind of living paycheck to paycheck right now. <laughs> I don't even know how I'm doing it. Well, have you tried saving a little? <laughs> I want to, but where's that money going to come from? <laughs> Bill collectors, they're the worst. Am I right? When it comes to financial <laughs> stability, don't get left behind. Not home. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. Animals have pretty good noses. They sniff out what they need. It's there for them at the New Rochelle Humane Society. For 100 years, we provided a caring, transitional home for animals in need in 17 Westchester communities and beyond, while we search for the right permanent home for each animal. Help us help more of them follow their noses to a happy home. New Rochelle Humane Society, from our home to yours.